This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora, ko William Rayaho. So I'll start off with the bad news. Um, Black Sheep is going on a bit of an extended holiday this year, and that's because I'm about to start work on another really cool history project for RNZ. Instead of telling the story of New Zealand's villains, we're going to cover the whole story of Aotearoa from start to finish as part of an animated web series. We reckon there'll be about a dozen episodes, like 10 to 15 minutes long each. The idea is this is sort of a starting point for anyone who wants to learn a bit more about New Zealand's past, but isn't a huge fan of big long history books. I actually haven't come up with a good idea for a name yet, so get in touch if you think of anything good. Hopefully, the first episodes will be out in July and we'll be able to get a new season of Black Sheep released before the end of the year. Anyway, in the meantime, here's something special for you. Last week, I went down to Christchurch and we did a live recording of Black Sheep as part of the Bread and Circus World Buskers Festival. I had a really awesome time and it was actually really cool to meet some of you Black Sheep super fans out there face to face. We'll definitely be doing another live episode at some stage, so keep your ears out and I'll let you know when that's happening. Anyway, see you later in the year. Kia ora everyone, thank you very much for, for coming along. I'm William Ray, I'm the host of the Black Sheep podcast. Um, just out of interest, are there many people here who haven't listened to Black Sheep before? Yeah, a few? Okay, well just for your benefit, so Black Sheep is a show about the history of sort of villainous or controversial or just sort of darker figures from New Zealand history, but we also sometimes do sort of ideas and practices from New Zealand history. So a while back we did an episode on the history of eugenics in New Zealand, and this show is a little bit more like that one. We're doing the history of the death penalty of executions. So it's a bit of a grim subject, as you may have picked up from the music that was playing as you all walked in, um, but it's also totally fascinating, I think. I think it highlights sort of how people, and even quite powerful people, sort of get caught up in the gears of powerful forces in history. But before we get too much into that, I should um, introduce the guests. So first, we'll start from the furthest. We have uh, Vincent O'Malley. Vincent is a historian who's written really extensively on the history of Pākehā and Māori relations, particularly in the 19th century. Uh, his most recent book is The Great War for New Zealand, which is about the Waikato War. And I, if you're interested at all in the history of the New Zealand Wars, which I'm guessing if you listen to Black Sheep, you might be, pick up a copy and have a read of that. Uh, next, we have Mark Darby. Mark is actually the guy who helped me come up with the idea behind Black Sheep. Um, and Vincent, uh, sorry, Mark, has, um, is in the process of writing a book on the history of Mount Eden Prison, which is where a lot of the executions in New Zealand happened. And finally, right beside me, we have uh, Dame Fiona Kidman, who is an award-winning author, poet, and all-around all-star of the New Zealand literature scene. And she's here today because uh, one of her books, which she has sitting in front of her, in case you want to see what it looks like, is about one of the very last executions which happened in New Zealand before the death penalty was abolished. So, introduction's over. Um, let's get down to it. So we'll start with, um, with you, Vincent. So obviously, you know, executions in New Zealand predate European arrival in this country, but quite often the first sort of judicial execution which gets written down in the history books is a guy called um, Makatu Wharetotara. What's his story? So Makatu Wharetotara was 17 years old at the time that he was executed, uh, 7th of March, 1842, and he had killed a um, settler family called the Robertons in the Bay of Islands. Um, he was working on their farm at the time and he had been abused by them, and he felt that his, his mana had been undermined as a result. It was quite a brutal murder, wasn't it, of a reasonably large number of people. Yeah, um, a settler woman who was a widow, and um, her two young children, um, another man who worked on a farm, and also, um, crucially, a Māori girl who was living with the family as well, Isabella Brind. And this is sort of the interesting thing, because from the Pākehā perspective, obviously, you know, one Māori girl who was working on a farm didn't mean much. But this whole thing, this whole execution of Makatu really revolved around this one young woman. Absolutely, uh, because that Māori girl, Isabella Brind, was the granddaughter of Rewa, who was one of the most senior rangatira at the Bay of Islands. Makatu's father, Ruhe, um, was also an important rangatira um, in the area, and 
the decision to hand Makatu over for arrest was a, a result of the um, tribal politics at the time and fears that um, an even greater calamity would befall Māori in the area um, if that didn't happen. So the government had no ability to arrest Makatu. In fact, the local police magistrate didn't even attempt to do so. He knew that he couldn't do it. He just didn't have the power, he didn't have the authority, he didn't have the force at hand. The decision to hand Makatu over is one made by his relatives in order to avoid um, Utu being um, taken out on them and, and potentially tribal warf serious tribal warfare at the Bay of Islands. So rather than highlighting the, um, the government's power and authority, um, a lot of Europeans at the time observed that it actually showed just how weak it was. The Crown is so concerned that it actually delays the trial by a day um, in order to allow a Pākehā who's also on trial for murder uh, for that case to be considered first. Uh, so potentially that would be the first execution in New Zealand. The problem with that is that the, the Pākehā is found guilty of manslaughter and so mm. there's no capital um, uh, sentence passed down. Well, was it also, was it like sort of the government trying to sort of show, you know, we're not here to execute Māori, this is sort of justice playing out, look, we've killed one of our own, so that makes this whole thing OK? Absolutely. Um, one of the great fears that expressed by Rangatira um, at the treaty signing in Waitangi in 1840 is if we sign this document, Rangatira could, could be executed by the mm. Crown. The idea behind this was to avoid a war, and it ends up actually contributing to a different war. That's right, because um, Hone Heke, who, of course, famously chops down the flagstaff at Kororaraka four times, he's outraged by the decision to hand Makatu over uh, to authorities. He sees it as a betrayal of of Ngāpui. He sees that this is something that is purely a Ngāpui matter, and Māori at the time think that the Crown has no business interfering in their own affairs and that this was a case that should have been sorted out internally by themselves because Rewa's daughter was one of those who was the victim uh, of the crime. And I mean, he sort of, his fears are kind of justified later on because the, the usually the official number of executions in New Zealand is put around 85, but that misses out a lot of other executions, for want of a better word, which happen as part of the New Zealand wars under martial law. So this is where, you know, fighting spills out across Waikato and, and Taranaki and elsewhere in New Zealand. And a lot of Māori are sort of summarily killed as part of that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, as, as it is with the, um, the 85 who were executed under criminal law, 30% of those were Māori. So that's an incredibly high figure. But there are others who are executed under martial law. Um, the first of those um, is, is a rangatira called Te Whariaitu, and he's um, arrested at Paua Tahanui, 1846, during um, Te Rangi Hayata's war against the Crown in the Wellington region. Um, he's charged with rebellion, um, and he's hanged two days later at the uh, Paramata um, barracks in Wellington. Um, and the decision is seen as so controversial that there's even you know some public Pākehā unease about this um, and the Crown has difficulty finding somebody who's willing to perform the role uh, of executioner. Eventually a soldier is bribed with a bag of gold um, and that soldier dies in quite frequent circumstances less than a year later and it's said to be a sort of curse for his role um, mm. in executing Te Whareaitu. And that, that execution has a series of consequences because Te Whareaitu is from the Whanganui district and he's a relative of Topani to Mamaku, who's a, one of the great rangatira there. And so there's unrest spreads to the Whanganui district. The Crown brings troops in. There's a, um, an, an incident where a rangatira is accidentally um, wounded uh, by one of the troops. And in retaliation for that, um, a settler family, the Gilfillans, um, are killed. Um, and, and the killers, um, five of the six killers, are, are captured by Māori and handed over... Um, for trial, and of those five, um, that they range in, in ages between 12 and 18, so the oldest is 18. Um, the boy who's 12 is spared execution, but the other four um, are executed days later. And their, um, their bodies are actually left on, on public display mm. uh, on Main Street of Whanganui uh, for the entire day, sending a very clear message to Māori. Um, and again, this is, seen, this is seen as something that's incredibly... Um, ruthless um, 
and Governor Gray um, is kind of sending um, a message to Māori at the time that he's literally not taking any prisoners. I mean, it just seems to get worse and worse. I mean, as the New Zealand wars get on and everyone becomes sort of more and more polarised, it goes from sort of a crown which is very cautious about executing Māori to a crown which almost feels like it has to, to sort of appeal, appease public opinion. We kind of think of the law today as something that is impartial. In the 19th century, um, English law is not like that. It's been used as a weapon against Māori. It's a tool of colonisation. And, I mean, it gets to the point where the law barely comes into it. I'm thinking particularly of the Natapa massacre here, which is part of Te Kuti's rebellion. Um, if people don't know, Te Kuti was a, um, a Māori prophet in Gisborne. And he, as he was trying to basically leave Gisborne with a group of followers, the details around it are very complicated, but there is a massacre at Poverty Bay where a number of settlers are killed. And the Crown bottle Te Kuti and his followers up at a pa called Natapa. And what happens after that um, siege is really quite horrific. And we actually have uh, an eyewitness account. Some 130 odd of the defenders of Ngatapa were captured in the bush and gorges below the pa where they lay asleep, having had neither sleep nor water for two days. They were marched up the hillside again under the outer wall of the pa they had defended so long and so heroically, stripped of every vestige of clothing they possessed and shot. Shot like dogs. There was no mention of a trial or if any or all of them had participated in the Poverty Bay Massacre. That didn't matter to us one straw. They were shot and their bodies left to swelter and rot under the summer's sun and bones to bleach to this day. I mean, 130 people is about as many people are in this room right now. So you can imagine that happening. And when you think that there are 85 official executions in New Zealand, so we've already nearly doubled that just with this one incident. I mean, the context for this is what in that clip was described as a Poverty Bay Massacre, otherwise um, uh, known by Pākehā as the Matawhiro Massacre. November 1868, uh, Te Kuti and his followers attacked the settlement of Matawhiro, um, killed about 50 Māori and Pākehā in that settlement, in including young children, babies and so on. Um, and, and this was something that was seen as an outrage and there was a determination to make those responsible pay for this. Um, even though there's, there's a wider context that Te Kuti and his followers had been imprisoned on the Chatham Islands without trial since 1866 and escaped and made their way back to Poverty Bay. Nevertheless, Natapa is supposed to be revenge, it's supposed to be payback for this, but the cruel irony is that many of those who were stripped naked, lined up against the side of the cliff and, and, and shot uh, in cold blood at Natapa were very likely to put these prisoners. Um, because during the, the, the five-day siege at Natapa, um, food and water was in very short supply, and so it was reserved for the fighters there, not their prisoners. And so those who were the most likely to be caught in the pursuit that followed over the subsequent days were those were the prisoners who would have been in the weakest condition. So many of the people who were um, taken prisoner by Tukuti at Matawhiro and at Oweta uh, were, were among those um, executed in this way. And I mean, when it comes to the people actually carrying out these executions, they were Ngāti Poro Māori who were allied with the government. And when the, when the Waitangi Tribunal came to sort of look at this whole case and sort of whether the Crown needed to make redresses, the Crown sort of said, oh, it had nothing to do with us. It was all these Ngāti Poro um, who did the actual killing. Uh, but you don't really think that stacks up. No, well, the, the Waitangi Tribunal considered those arguments and it found that they were um, Crown forces who happened to also be Ngāti Pirau. Uh, senior Government Minister JC Richmond was there, um, along with the Commander of Military Forces, George Whitmore, um, and they both knew about the killings. Um, the, these are being freely reported in the newspapers at the time. Um, and Richmond also writes at the time that the Māori allies were off... Um, on a hunt to exterminate um, the rebels, and he said that he thought it right on behalf of the government not to not to um, 
prevent them from doing so. Because it kind of lined up with Crown objectives at this time. I mean, by this time you have newspaper accounts, mainstream newspapers, saying that the outcome of this, these New Zealand wars was going to have to be the extermination of Māori. The wars take a, um, enter a much darker phase by the late 1860s. After 1866, British troops play no role at all uh, in the conflict, so it's just colonial troops and the Māori allies. And so there's this much harsher um, and more racially tinged tone to the conflicts, um, which is ironic given how reliant the Crown is on its Māori allies at this time. And I think what happens at Ngātapa reflects that. Um, and the Waitangi Tribunal um, described it as a stain upon the history of this country and its report, and also something that so many New Zealanders know nothing about, because we, do, we don't learn about this history at school. I mean, the fact that it's not included in the list of executions... Where do you come down on this? Because, I mean, you could argue this is not a judicial execution, there's no trial, but it does seem strange that we sort of talk about there being 85 executions in New Zealand history and ignore the, what, the estimates are anywhere from around 90 to 130 people at Natapa. Yes, I mean, the fact that they were extrajudicial executions doesn't, doesn't um, you know, stop the fact that they were actually executions that were carried out by the Crown. So we're a bit pushed for time, so we're going to have to sort of move along here, and I'll bring in our next guest, uh, Mark Darby. So Mark's in the process of writing a book about um, Mount Eden Prison. I think you've just finished it, haven't you? Much. Yeah, and um, it hasn't got a title yet, so if you have any um, suggestions, please approach Mark after the show. Um, and Mount Eden is where the majority of executions happen, sort of late 19th and early 20th century. Yeah, I think so. Of that 85, at least 40 uh, took place at Mount Eden and before Mount Eden was built back in the 1840s, the execution that uh, Vince began talking about what he told, was at the predecessor to Mount Eden down in, in Queen Street, an old jail there. Um, and those early executions were, as Vince pointed out, in public. Uh, that was considered to be part of the deterrent effect I think around about the 1840s, uh, 1880s, was it, Vince? They, they, they made it illegal to carry them out in public. And after that, they, the executions took place within the jail itself. Public executions are sort of something worth dwelling on a little bit because, I mean, how many of you think you'd go to a public execution? If, if, if we were holding one on stage right now, I mean, pick any one of our guests. Because, um, <laughs> like, I, I don't think anyone here would go to an execution. One person. <laughs> Yeah, there's always one. <laughs> but they were enormously popular. And even when they brought, got brought behind closed doors, for example, the execution of Minnie Dean, which we don't have time to talk about here, and I will do a podcast on Minnie Dean, I promise, there were people who would line up outside the jail where the execution was being happened, and there were souvenirs being passed out to people who were there. And these things never really... It wasn't the public who decided to stop going. It was the officials who decided... No, you're not allowed to come. And even after they, uh, the public executions were banned, people made strenuous efforts to witness them. Those of you who know Mount Eden Prison will know that it's overlooked by Mount Eden itself, and people thronged the, uh, the peak and tried to look down into the jail, into the yard where the execution was taking place. They weren't allowed to, and there were police up there to shoo them away, but they turned up anyway. The yard where the executions took place in Mount Eden, which is the prison I know best um, uh, and, and the one I'll be talking about most, they've sealed it in altogether, covered it off from public view, and the only people that could uh, witness them were um, about 10 or a dozen invited guests who included uh, journalists and a, a few uh, bigwigs. One weird detail is that for quite a long time into the 20th century, there was no official hangman. So who is going to do the job of pulling the lever? Well, uh, the way it was usually done is that they would uh, find a fellow inmate of the institution to volunteer for the job. This raised one obvious uh, risk. Uh, that is that you're having an amateur who possibly has no experience of the job hanging you. Not ideal for a complicated process like that. And uh, there were indeed many bungled executions that we know of. 
And there are quite a few cases where they'll talk about the noose slipping. So it's meant to be, you know, at the back of your neck, so it breaks your neck when you fall. And quite often it'll slip, so it's around the side, and you start basically suffocating. And in that case, the hangman has to go up and grab your legs and pull you down so that you die faster. So it's a pretty miserable job. And we actually have an interview with uh, one of the hangmen who didn't give his name because it was sort of seen as a very secret thing. In fact, he, he says none of his friends knew who he was. I suppose that if my friends and acquaintances knew that I was a hangman, knew that I was the man who executed Munn last Tuesday week, they, they would shun me. A few perhaps would talk to me and try to find out how I could execute a fellow being, what my feelings and thoughts are when I'm carrying out the job. This curiosity is natural. No doubt a lot of people wonder how an executioner feels about it, but it's difficult to define my feelings and hard to make my viewpoint plain to the ordinary person. It was six or seven years ago that I attended my first execution. Why did I apply for the job? Well, it wasn't through callousness or morbid curiosity or anything like that. The position was offering, and I applied just in the ordinary way. Someone had to do the job. Why not me as much as anyone else? Most people, of course, can't understand how a hangman can perform the work he does, but I can't see that the man who carries out the law to its ultimate, if terrible, end is any more to be abhorred than the judge who pronounces the death sentence or the jury which finds the condemned man guilty. I perform my end of the job, just as the judge and jury perform theirs, the only difference being that they are spared the unpleasantness of that last act. So, you, I mean, you can imagine that point of view. If this was your job, you'd kind of have to think about it that way. But there were hangmen who weren't able to sort of divorce themselves from the, from the job to that degree. Yeah, that, that guy sounds pretty blithe and unbothered by what he does. We know that that was an exceptional position. Whenever a hangman was appointed, and that guy quite obviously dates from the 1930s, from the period when there was an official professional hangman. There always had to be at least two of them. If the guy, the main hangman, wasn't able or willing to do it within that time, then you had this backup. Sometimes you actually needed two backups because both the, the, the first two hangmen more or less fell apart, emotionally fell apart, were physically and emotionally unable to do the job they were being paid to do. This wasn't rare. And it wasn't limited just to the people who had to, you know, pull the lever. It was almost the sort of prevailing view within the prison that this was just sort of something that was so horrible. For guys who worked in prisons, for the superintendent, for the warders and so on, an execution was a major disruption, an unfortunate problem that they had to deal with because it was very, very distressing for all concerned and especially, of course, the other inmates. When they knew that someone was about to be hanged, the prison was in a more or less uproarious state. And at the moment of the execution itself, everyone would hammer on their doors, bang whatever things they, they, they could find in their cell to make, and make as much noise and uproar as they possibly could. This happened every time that we know of. Um, uh, where the inmates were permitted to know that an execution was happening. And we also know that those officials and staff who took part, some of them were permanently emotionally disabled by that experience. They became drunkards. They, they suffered nervous breakdowns, basically. And some of the worst cases of that is actually something you've covered in your book, Fiona. One of the sort of fairly awful thing for these prison officials is that as we get further into the middle of the 20th century, the first Labour government basically abolishes the death penalty, but it goes in and out. It's, it's banned and then brought back in. And some of the prison officials who were appointed in that time period where it was, where it was abolished didn't expect they'd have to deal with hangings, and then suddenly they do. And you can sort of imagine that's a very invidious position to be in. Well, it became a very political activity. When the Labour Party w was in, 
uh, in governance in between 1935 and 1950, the death sentence was commuted throughout that time. And it wasn't until 1950 that it was reintroduced. It was reintroduced because there had been a particularly dastardly murder on Mount Victoria in Wellington by a man called uh, Edward Horton, who killed a, a, a woman, bludgeoned a woman and raped her uh, on Mount Victoria. And it was just the national government had just come into power after many years sitting on the sidelines, and they said that they would reintroduce hanging, and it's, it was politically thought in the Labour Party that they would get back in because they were going to reintroduce hanging. There was actually a great quote from the leader of the Labour Party who said that National uh, swung to victory on the hangman's noose or something like that. <laughs> something like that, yes. So after some considerable time of, of there being no death penalty, it was back in style. And there were, in between 1950 and 1961, when the death penalty was abolished, um, there were eight hangings, four of which took place in one year alone in 1955. So four men, four young men, there was the one which I have followed, the second to last person to be hanged in New Zealand, Albert Black, who was known as the jukebox killer. Yeah. And the, the background to this case is really fascinating because millennials like myself complain about the sort of older generation having a go at us. But, I mean, in the, in the 1950s, they brought back hanging to deal with sort of what were seen as uppity teenagers. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and Albert, Black's, Albert Black was a 20-year-old boy from Belfast. He'd come to New Zealand as an assisted uh, immigrant in um, 1953 when he was 18. He was a person who had no history of violence. He had lived in the Hutt Valley. Now, the Hutt Valley was actually where there was a scandalous sort of outbreak and the Truth newspaper had reported that there were kids having sex on the riverbanks and they were petting in the backs of cinemas and there were young girls who were having having sex, and it was mostly the girls' fault, but it was also... The, as the, it always as is. Of course, <laughs> of course. There was... Cinema was very popular, and American culture was just being introduced into New Zealand in a big way. As American cinema and American comics and American literature was uh, started to be introduced into New Zealand, so to a rise of moral panic... And when Truth newspaper said that these things were going on in the Hutt Valley, Sid Holland um, commissioned his friend, a man called Oswald Mazengarb, to write a report on the morals of New Zealand teenagers. And this was created a sense of panic and hysteria throughout New Zealand. What is not widely known is that there was active book burnings going on in the 1950s. Police were going through the country and checking to see whether there were books by, in particular, a man called Mickey Spillane, who some of you might be old enough to remember, wrote books like I, the Jury. And these books were banned. It was, Tina, it was outsiders, people like Albert Black, who were seen as being people who were introducing, you know, bad ideas and bad morals into the country. And it, this this report, the Mazengarb report, yes, a hundred, what was it, ten thousand copies were sort of pushed under the the front doors of of families all around New Zealand. Every household that was receiving the family benefit at that time received a copy of the Mazengarb report. So I think it may have been more than ten thousand. And one of, the, I mean, you remember this happening? You were you would have been a teenager around the same time. I was time. a teenager. Yes, I was fifteen years old. So work it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, when Albert Black was hanged that year. And so we had a really strong sense. I mean, it wasn't talked about a lot, and my family didn't subscribe to Truth um, newspaper, but my relatives in the Waikato did, and I would go down for holidays there, and I would see Truth, and I would see the reports about the worry about how these, about what was happening. And I mean, 
because I've, I've, I as I was saying, I just finished your book this week, and it is just so. I mean, obviously, it's sad. It's a book about someone getting, getting executed. Well, you know what's going to happen yeah, at the yeah. end. <laughs> yeah, spoilers, everyone, in case you're thinking you're really <laughs> um, But, like, I think one of the s- things I found most sad about it is that you sort of cover these people who are in positions of power, people who are in senior positions in the government, mm. who mm. are doing all they can to stop this hanging. Yes, well, uh, there was a minister um, in, in the national government called Ralph Hannon, and he was he was against the um, the death penalty. So am I. Um, so I believe are most reasonable people in this day and age. Although somebody may well argue with me about that. That one guy over there who wants to go to a hanging. <laughs> the, the 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 famous nineteenth century novelist Victor Hugo said wrote somewhere um, that when an individual commits a killing, it's a crime. When society commits it, it suddenly becomes justice. You can't actually equate the two, that that a killing, that, that we are, that we become people who are committing acts of revenge when we, just, when we kill someone. Ralph Hannum was going out of his way to have Albert Black's hanging stopped. The Attorney General at the time was um, Jack Marshall, who was later the Prime Min- briefly the Prime Minister. And he believed seriously in the death penalty. And one of his arguments was that it was kinder and more humane to put somebody to death than to leave them in jail for the rest of their lives. I've, I've always found that such a strange argument because, I mean, you don't see many prisoners who are in jail for life saying, please hang me. No, I, I agree. However, I'm prepared to accept that it was a genuine belief. People later called him Gentleman Jack. Other people called him Slippery Jack. Mm. Take your pick. Yeah. I mean, another really sad character in your book is the superintendent of the prison. And, Mark, I know you've written a, f- a fair amount about him. I mean, he seems to have just been destroyed as a human being. His name was Horace Haywood, and he was a tough guy. He had spent most of his career working in prisons, and he was known as a tough, unsentimental, hard man. But he also had to uh, be present at a succession of these hangings. As Fiona said, there were eight in those few years in the 50s when it was reintroduced, and he was superintendent throughout that period. By the end... He was incapable of doing his job. He was a, uh, an advanced drunkard. He'd fall asleep <laughs> during the day when he's supposed to be at work. Um, it, was a, it was clearly uh, an appalling experience for the man, you know. Um, these guys who were hanged, as Fiona said, they were almost entirely young, poorly educated, few skills. They'd committed a terrible offence in a moment of inexplicable kind of outrage and uh, and was not necessarily uh, indicative of the rest of their lives or everything else about their character. Mm. And Haywood knew this. It was uh, an intolerable burden for the man. Someone else who had to be present at every hanging by law was the guy they called the sheriff, very sort of medieval, old-fashioned term. The sheriff was actually the registrar of the Auckland Supreme Court. Now, uh, two registrars... Two sheriffs in succession had nervous breakdowns. The guy who was due to take over as the third one said, I will not take that job under any circumstances if I have to attend a hanging. And it was that kind of accumulated distress, really, that uh, contributed to the unstoppable movement for abolition, I believe. And, I mean, if you want to hear from someone who actually witnessed hanging or a hanging in this period, there is actually an interview with him. His name's Don McKenzie, and he was actually the prison psychologist, so he had to deal with these people in the lead-up to the hanging. And he actually did an interview with um, Morning Report, and we'll just play that for you now. Well, as the execution approaches, the um, prison goes quieter. A sort of grim moodiness settles over the place, and uh, staff become a little more agitated, uh, nervous, apprehensive, especially the superintendent who, of course, has to carry the full burden. The prisoners themselves become uh, very 
sad and uh, usually try to do something for the condemned man, give him cigarettes or something like that. But um, there is a, an odd silence over the place as the day approaches. As part of your duties, did you have to attend a hanging? Yes, I did. Uh, it wasn't part of my duty, but uh, I think the superintendent felt that I should, as a member of the staff, attend at least one hanging. Could I ask what effect it had on you, personally? Absolutely dreadful. Um, quite the most unforgettable event in my life. And uh, I hope never to have such a, an experience again. Did it colour your feelings about the death penalty at all? Well, I was never in favour of it, but certainly having been to one um, made my feelings absolutely concrete as far as that is concerned. So you kind of get the feeling here, right? Like you, you have sort of these politicians and a fair chunk of the public who are very up with hanging, very think it's a fantastic idea. But you see these people who are very tough individuals, a lot of them had fought in the Second World War, who were just completely destroyed by it. And I mean, were they, were they sort of the main people in the abolition movement or was it sort of pressure groups from the outside, Mark? There were elements of the Christian church, certainly. There were um, significant um, church groups who felt that it was wrong for the government to uh, to take a life for a life in that way. Um, the Labour movement, as Fiona said, the Labour Party's policy, uh, since its formation pretty much, was opposed uh, to capital punishment. Um, and there were also um, people who were just generally humanitarian, internationalist people. I mean, we have to remember that New Zealand was in the rear guard uh, internationally in still maintaining the death penalty. M many, perhaps most other countries, had abolished it uh, before we did. And so people who were in touch with the rest of the world who uh, belonged to the United Nations Association and, and organisations like that, they would have been opposed as well. Albert Black's death was a step towards the abolition of the death penalty because what actually happened there was that reporter who went into this to witness Black's execution was a man called Jack Young. He wrote an anonymous piece. He broke the rules in which he described the hanging step by terrible step. Jack Young's account of this hanging caused a wave of public revulsion and the Labour Party came back into power in 1957, yes, I think, yes, 1957. They again suspended um, hangings and then National Party got back in, in 1960 and in 1961, Ralph Hannan, he was still trying to persuade his colleagues not to not to continue to, to hang people, and he persuaded nine members of the national government to cross the floor and vote with Labour. And so Albert Black was the second to last person to be hanged in New Zealand, but he plays a significant part in what became the abolition of capital punishment. The thing that has interested me, and the re part of the reason why... I wanted to write this book is that an execution is not just about the person who who is hanged but about a whole range of people all the people in the prison as Mark has said um, in this case the family of Albert Black who are back in Northern Ireland and the mother raises a petition with 12,000 signatures to give to the New Zealand government. She writes to the Queen. Attorney General, however, says she's not even allowed to come to New Zealand to say goodbye to her son. So there are these heart-rending effects that ripple through whole communities and it's about a lot more than one person and one act. It's about our society and what we consider to be justice or not. This morning on the plane, I ripped out a piece of the Dominion newspaper. Man cleared after 19 years. Huey Burton was 16 when he was accused of stabbing his mother to death, then staging the scene to make it appear an intruder had sexually assaulted and killed her. He insisted for decades he didn't commit the crime. I won't read it all to you, but I think you probably 
get the drift. 19 years later, he's fa it's found that he was not the offender. And the big question, whatever your moral attitude is towards the death penalty is, what if you get it wrong? And in the case of Albert Black, there are a number of reasons which lead me to the conclusion, led me to the conclusion that it was a case of provocation or self-defense that probably in today's courts would have led to a conviction for manslaughter rather than murder. And so again, there are so many questions to answer. And I think that's actually probably the note on which we're going to have to wrap up this conversation. But yeah, thank you very much for coming along today. Oh, and also I should say, thank you to everyone at Bread and Circus for organising this thing, all the technical staff and front of house staff, and also to Justin Gregory from Radio New Zealand, who's been pushing the buttons to make stuff play, and Alex Harmer, who's been doing the recording for us today. Thank you very much. And finally, thank you to our lovely guests. <laughs> Buy their books. <laughs> Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. Our sound engineer is Mark Chesterman. This live episode was produced with some help from Melody Thomas. And speaking of Melody, her awesome podcast, Bang, is out with a new series very soon. And she also recorded a live show which features the most ridiculous story about a vibrator I've ever heard. Do yourself a favour and go check it out. You can find her via the series and podcast page at RNZ or through Apple Podcast or whatever other podcasting app you choose. Please take the time to rate and subscribe. Kakite. <laughs>